Good evening, everybody. The time is 5.45 p.m. And I'd like to welcome you to the special closed session meeting of the City Council of the City of Emeryville for today, Tuesday, June 20th, 2023. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the public are welcome to join us here at the Emeryville Civic Center. You can also join us using the link provided for in the agenda. I would like to begin the meeting by asking the clerk to take the roll. Council Member Carr. Present. Council Member Mora. Present. Council Member Pryforce. Here. Vice Mayor Welch. Here. And Mayor Bowders. Here. Uh, next is ex parte communications. Are there any members who wish to report an ex parte communication? No. I seeing and hearing none. Now is the time for public comment. A member of the public wishing to comment for an item not on the agenda for the closed session has two minutes. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any members of the public with hands raised? No, Mayor, they're not. The public comment is now closed. Madam Clerk, the time is 546. I'm adjourning us to closed session for items five, six, and we'll report out at seven. Thank you.
Welcome back. The time is 6.29 p.m. and we are returning from the closed session portion of this meeting. Item 7 is reporting out of closed session. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We had no reportable action this evening except for item 6.1.1 and 6.1.2. On item 6.1.1, on a motion from Councilmember Carr and a second from Councilmember Welch, the council voted unanimously to reject the claim. And item 6.1.2, on a motion by Councilmember Carr and a second by Councilmember Welch, the council voted unanimously to reject the claim. Okay, thank you. That concludes the reporting out of closed session. The time is 6.29, Madam Clerk. This meeting stands adjourned. We are in recess until 645 for those who are viewing at home to conduct the city's study session.
Good evening. The time is 6.45 p.m. I would like to call to order this special study session for the City of Emeryville City Council today, Tuesday, June 20th, 2023. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the City Council and the public are invited to join us here at Emeryville City Hall. You can also follow this meeting via Zoom using the link provided for in today's agenda. I'd like to begin this meeting by asking if the clerk would please take the roll. Councilmember Carr. Present. Councilmember Mora. Present. Councilmember Pryfors. Here. Vice Mayor Welch. Here. And Mayor Bowders. Here. Item three, approval of the final agenda. Is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Thank you, motion by Welch, second by Carr to approve the agenda. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryfors. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. Agenda has been approved. Item four, ex parte communications. Any members wishing to uh, provide ex parte communications on this meeting? Seeing and hearing none. Item five is public comment for items not on the agenda. A member of the public wishing to comment on an item not on this agenda has two minutes to do so. April, do we have any hands raised for this? No, Mayor, we do not. Okay, do we receive any written comments for this meeting? No. Okay, public comment is now closed. Item six is the study session. We have one study session item tonight. Multifamily bulky pickup services update. This was referred to the city council for study by Vice Mayor Welch. And I will turn it over to staff and Matt Anderson. Good evening. One second here. April, is that uh, screen share mode? Well, bam. All right, there we go. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, Matt Anderson, Environmental Programs Analyst for the Public Works Department. Uh, here today to talk about trash, uh, specifically bulky waste pickup in multifamily properties. Um, so why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Why is this important? Um, this was an item that was referred uh, to the council by Vice Mayor Welch. Um, it's an item with uh, potential to affect a significant portion of Emeryville residents. 72% uh, of the units of housing in Emeryville are renter occupied and this would affect potentially how they could um, take care of their excess trash. Uh, when reviewing the waste contract, we found a discrepancy in the amount of cubic yardage that's allocated to those folks in single family homes versus those folks that live in multifamily uh, buildings. And additionally, uh, illegal dumping is a significant issue, uh, both in Emeryville, the Bay Area, across California. Uh, but locally, we get over 100 C-click fix tickets just for illegal dumping every year, and uh, that takes a significant time out of public works crew that they could be otherwise uh, spending on maintenance and um, items across the city, and that takes resources as well. Um, so just a quick background about our waste contract and where we are. Uh, we are exclusively franchised to Waste Management of Alameda County, uh, or WM, they take care of almost all of the waste services in our city. That includes the regular curbside pickup, uh, bulky pickup, construction demolition, the city cans that you see outside, things like that. Uh, we signed our original contract in 2010, and we signed an extension in 2020, so that's good through 2030. Uh, we, they do have the exclusive rights to bulky in our city, so uh, any potential conversation would probably start with them in terms of future um, programs. Uh, and one thing I did want to highlight, um, you know, about our program here is that we have some of the lowest rates in the entire Bay Area. Um, we're often pointed to, especially being adjacent to Oakland, who has some of the highest rates, um, as uh, a, good, a good model. Um, we have the second lowest residential rates in all of Alameda County, and we have the fourth lowest commercial rates in all of Alameda County. Um, so definitely we have a, a favorable contract for both our residents and our businesses. So a little bit in specific about our bulky contract. Um, before I get into this, just a quick definition. Uh, SFD is single family dwelling or single family home. That's uh, single family home, uh, duplex, triplex, uh, one through three units. And then multifamily dwelling, MFD, is four units and above. Um, so in our contract, uh, single family homes get uh, two free pickups every year. One of those is the April spring bulky cleanup, 
second week of April, and the other one is on call that they can schedule at the time of their choosing. Uh, multifamily buildings also get two free pickups for buildings four through 500 units, and then buildings that have more than 500 units get four, um, and those are on call at the time of their choosing. And the site, you can see the sizes there, uh, CY is cubic yardage for um, that. Uh, and then additional pickups are available for a fee. Um, it's $278 plus $71 uh, per cubic yard for single family. And it, uh, multifamily are charged on the uh, commercial rate. So it would depend on the size they want, but it could vary from a couple hundred to over $1,000 depending on the size. And it's, a, it's about $1,000 for a 30 cubic yard which is the standard if you're doing multiple uh, tenants. Um, and then one thing I wanted to highlight here is that the account holder is the one that's always required to call. And um, in single family um, buildings, the occupant is frequently the uh, account holder, whereas in multifamily buildings, that is frequently not the case. So there are quite a few issues um, you know, related to multifamily bulky pickup that have been identified. Um, both here and around the Bay Area, this is a topic that's becoming a, a more of a discussion in, in other cities as well. Um, but a, a few things that I wanted to highlight, um, barriers to access for folks that are living in multifamily buildings. They don't have the ability to schedule a pickup and they have to work through a whole other layer of bureaucracy, their landlord or the building owner who may or may not be receptive to scheduling that. Um, the cubic yardage per unit thing I mentioned earlier, it's not um, equal in the single family uh, versus multifamily per unit. Um, also publicity, just getting uh, multifamily um, developments, multifamily buildings and tenants to know what the, the service is available. Frequently, um, via waste management, all the outreach goes out to the account holders. And so um, that would be a topic for discussion if the program were to change how that outreach would happen. Um, but that is currently an issue. Um, and then last but not least is availability. You know, if you're in a 50 unit complex and you only get two per year, if you're trying to move out in July, well, yeah, you, there's a very good chance you're out of luck and there's just nothing else that can be done or you can pay a lot of money. So I did put together a quick, um, hope hopefully compact uh, comparison of the different uh, cities in Alameda County. Um, and one thing I just, a couple things I wanted to highlight here, but really the variation is one thing. Um, I tried to distill it down into a cost, but there, there's an asterisk after every one of these costs. Um, there's additional services with almost every one of them. Things vary from, in Berkeley, you have to buy a bag to bring it back to your apartment to then fill it, to then put it on the curb, or um, you, in, you can get a, a free pickup, but only up to 300 in Albany, or um, you, some places you get uh, free drop-off tags to go to Davis Street, uh, or some places you have a certain number of pickups for mattresses, but not for bulky um, items. So it's, it's just really a hodgepodge, and there isn't a good universal way to compare it, but uh, I did want to try and get a, a rough price estimate so you'll know what, um, what it looks like across the area. Um, two, two areas I wanted to highlight here we'll talk about a little further, but the city of Alameda and the city of Oakland uh, have both recently updated their contracts or portion of the, portions of their contracts, and uh, they have added the ability for tenants to call in directly and um, schedule a bulky, bulky pickup. So I will talk about those briefly. Um, in November 2021, Oakland updated um, an addendum to their contract and they uh, had several provisions. The highlight of it was they moved a whole route that was dedicated to picking up uh, illegally dumped items over to doing uh, bulky pickup for multifamily. Um, and some of the provisions that they also included in that were um, tenants are now allowed to schedule directly. Uh, they increase the size that are, is allowed per tenant uh, or per unit, and they also added a number of free drop-offs um, at Davis Street, and then they had an outreach campaign that included um, online and wraparounds on the truck and uh, various other items. Uh, I know cost is always a question. Uh, unfortunately, in these reviews, it's, uh, the costs are never delineated, um, 
and the only dollar amount that was laid out in this contract was what waste management would charge uh, for an additional bulky route if they had to start. There's so much capacity they needed to start a new service. And in that contract, they said it was $1 million per additional route. Um, I don't think that extrapolates to Emeryville necessarily, um, just as a scale comparison. They can handle about 50 pickups a day for bulky route, and we have 100, just a little over 100 pickups per year. So it, we're not going to you know, necessitate a new route by any means, but I just wanted the, the costs uh, to be out there so you were aware. Um, and then since the initiation of this program in 2021, we have had, or they have seen a 12% increase in the number of uh, bulky pickups that were scheduled, uh, and then overall an 8% utilization in the multifamily um, units that we're, we're calling in. Second one to highlight is Alameda, the city of Alameda. Um, they also, uh, they redid their entire contract, so this was uh, from scratch, and one thing they included um, was uh, tenants being able to schedule uh, their own bulky pickup. Um, and I should note that they are not a waste management city. They are contracted with ACI, Alameda County Industries. Um, another, another item they included was uh, Davis Street drop-offs. They also increased their size. Uh, and then another rider on that was they, asked, or they required their hauler to provide tags to the residents if the residents had any items that they wanted to donate. Uh, that were reusable rather than just trash or recyclable. And so they could set out those uh, donation items on curbside with the bulky pickup as well um, to, to push toward uh, reuse economy. So in conclusion, um, really just here to kind of get direction from you all um, and uh, have a discussion about this. A few things to maybe bear in mind uh, during that discussion, I want to uh, potentially talk about you know, where the cost of service of a program would be, whether this is something that uh, would want to be cost neutral or um, be uh, paid for by uh, folks who call in or uh, potential raise in rates. Um, also, uh, what other additional rates or services might be included? I highlighted a couple of them, but you know, if there are any other ones uh, that are of interest, um, that might be worth a discussion. And then um, really just looking for feedback and then um, permission from you all to uh, explore, you know, solutions that we talk about and uh, different opportunities that um, would offer bulky waste pickup uh, directly to the occupants of multifamily buildings. Great. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. We'll go to public comment first. Are there any members of the public wishing to provide comment on study session item 6.1? Do we have any hands raised? No, Mayor. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. We do. Okay. Brian Donahue. Can we recognize Brian Donahue for two minutes, please? Yeah, um, <clears throat> about four, four, a little more than four months ago, I, I, I videotaping the mayor at a at a ribbon cutting, and I asked him, um, "Why has it been since 2019?" Uh, uh, since the city did its last biannual traffic con or uh, bicycle safety on bike boulevards. We're supposed to do it biannually. We haven't done it since 2019. I asked the mayor, Mayor Bowders, why haven't, why, why are we so late? And he said he didn't know, but he would find out and get back to me. I'm, I'm letting everybody know here that uh, the mayor never got back to me. So I took it upon myself to try to find out since the mayor doesn't seem to be interested in bike safety on the bike boulevards. So I took it, took it upon myself to find out why we, the city has been re, uh, recalcitrant, why the, why no traffic counts as we're supposed to be doing. And then I, so I contacted the city manager and he uh, did not respond back. He refused to comment. He just didn't, or would, wouldn't tell me why. And then I contracted a staff member and the staff member uh after a, more than a month of me trying to get an answer the, the answer came back with is i don't know so the mayor doesn't know is not, doesn't appear to be interested the city of the city managers not interested not telling us but you know the thing is is our public policy so we have a right to know 
and, and bicyclists are being put in harm's way. And we know that because the last traffic count that city did do in 2019 showed there's too many cars on the bike boulevards. So it's unsafe. And we know that because the, the city determined that and that's, that's written into the bike ped plan. There's too many cars on a bike boulevard is unsafe. Thank you so, for your comment. Okay, I'm going to do a story about this. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other speakers? No, Mayor, there's not. Okay, great. So public comment is now closed, and we'll turn for discussion and comments. I'd like to invite the Vice Mayor to go first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Matt, thank you so much for your work on this item. This has been um, something that I know has been very important to my neighbors and I, and throughout just the Christie Core neighborhood where a lot of the apartments are um, centralized in Emeryville. We typically experience um, not just the dumping in the public, but unfortunately when people tend to move out of the buildings, they'll leave bulkier waste, old furniture and things, not just in the trash rooms, but people have told me also in the garages. And so it's really a quality of life issue that's impacting us that live in multifamily housing. And I just really appreciate your hard work and your research thus far. I had a couple of questions. Um, the free pickup day, those are already scheduled. Do you know by any chance or have you heard or seen in any of your research if those days could be extended? That is something we could explore. Um, if they're not written into our contract right now, our contract only has uh, the ability to have one. Um, but that is definitely in terms of you know additional services that I mentioned could be something that would be, um, you know, we could get further information on and come back to you with. Thank you. And then my second question is, any possible changes in the contract? Is there a set timeline for renegotiation with the contract? I know that it is set until 2030, but is there any type of timeline where you would be set to revisit the contract, maybe at the five-year mark, or is it just if, if and when we wanted to revisit and have a renegotiation, it's just up to us and we would just reach out at that time? Unfortunately, there's no set timeline between now and 2030 um, that there's a renegotiation, a couple of triggers, like if there's a state law change or things like that, but nothing uh, that's on a timeline. So it would be up to us um, in our time schedule. Okay. But that, that is something we would be able to do. We could, before 2030, meet with them to renegotiate. If we wanted to, um, and I'm, I'm going to asterisk this, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to defer to our... <laughs> our city attorney, but my understanding is we could at least open negotiations and begin discussions if we wanted to before then. That is an ability that we have. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Others who have questions or comments? Thank you so much, Joseph. Oh, Member Corey? I want to thank, uh, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Actually, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, we are uh, also very interested in this bulk uh, so that that would be great to come back with the information that's requested. Thanks. Councilmember Moore, did you have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a, a few points. Um, one was that the I, I think renters were highlighted as a as a really strongly affected group, uh, but I think this affects all um, multifamily housing had dwellers um, as well. So, you know, the scope is, the problem is bad. I'm, I'm just echoing that. And uh, it, it includes everybody in multifamily housing. The logistics of working within that two bulky pickups a year is extremely challenging. I've never seen it successfully pulled off with like more than a handful of units. Um, so I, I just, my comment comes down to, um, I, I think where we really need to get is where uh, Oakland and Alameda uh, ended up, where they get one bulky pickup per unit, not per complex. So you're not grouping together hun potentially hundreds of people uh, in, into one coordinated pickup. Um, but I, And I think we, as far as direction, I do like the idea of being uh, cost neutral. Uh, I, so, you know, opportunities for savings include maybe spacing out those bulky pickups so you know
know, at most one week apart or two weeks apart. I, I don't know how that would look. Um, and despite the contract being uh, not up for a number of years, uh, I feel like waste management, they are a customer service oriented organization and we're highlighting a, an area in which they are failing their customers uh, and they might be interested to work with us and maybe there could be some sort of uh, addendum type agreement reached uh, when they understand the scope of the problem the way we do. Thank you. Any, uh, That's my comment. Council Member Pryforce. So I have a question. Uh, so I agree with the Council Member Mora. Uh, unfortunately, we do have some slum lords in Emeryville and it would be great if we had something similar to Oakland and Alameda where a unit especially someone who's moving out, uh, can call on uh, waste management to uh, get rid of the bulk rather than waiting for uh, that particular property manager to do something only when they know that there's going to be a tour uh, of the property for new customers. Vice Mayor Welch, you, have it? you had your hand raised. I did. Just um, in the staff report, you mentioned additional services, um, potentially contracting with a third party to recover reusable materials. Did, was there any specific party in mind you had for that at this time? No specific parties in mind at this time. Okay. Council Member Pryforce. My apology. I didn't phrase it in the form of a question. How do we get uh, there? in terms of how do we get to do what Oakland Alameda does? Apologies, I <clears throat> didn't understand the question at first. Um, so that's what I'm seeking direction on now. I think the next step is, um, you know, with your permission, understanding there's a general consensus, staff will go back um, and kind of gather more information, maybe start conversations to see what services are available, what that might look like, and then we would come back with a more fully flushed out um, idea and list of you know what's available, what it might look like for the council for the for the um, city. Have you um, surveyed the HOA and apartment buildings about the use of the current iteration of this this service? Uh, we have not surveyed them. We track it, or I get reports from waste management, and so we track it that way. Um, so I have some data on that if you're interested. But. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to, because I'd also like to link that to how much it's used. Like the, you know, if the landlords are proactively providing information in a way that helps people utilize it, because it may be an education or communication deficiency. So when you come back, I'd be curious about how that's working. Vice Mayor. I will just say, as for a comment, that I learned about the bulk pickup through the city's Twitter account the last time. I had actually learned about it. So it was through the city itself. It actually was not through my property management company. And so have you all been, Council Member Pyforce, were you ever, have you ever been alerted through Essex about any type of bulk waste pickup coming for tenants at all? Uh, no, ma'am, but I always see those big mattresses outside <laughs> on Overland <laughs> every time someone moves out. So I, you know, I appreciate you uh, placing this on the future agenda and this becoming a, a priority for the city. Councilmember Cora. Yes, I would see, like to see the same data that you would like to see, Mayor Bowders, about uh, how frequent uh, the pickups are at the HOA through this, because I know our HOA does this bulk pickup, and we have these trailers. I think we have them once a month, but I don't know if it is something that the HOA pays um, outside of what the city um, provides. Okay, Matt, do you feel like you have the information you need to come back with additional follow-up? I do indeed. We okay. can go ahead and get started on that. Great, thank you. Is there any further comment on this item? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Uh, Madam Clerk, the time is 7.09. The meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped. For the benefit of the public, we have a couple very brief meetings to conduct regular uh, business. We'll start at 7.14, so five minutes.
7.14 p.m. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the management of Emeryville Services Authority. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the public are welcome to join us here at Emeryville City Hall, situated at 1333 Park Avenue. or joining us via Zoom, providing the, provided by in the link in the agenda. I'll ask if the clerk would please begin by taking the roll. Councilmember Carr. Present. Councilmember Mora. Present. Councilmember Pryforce. Here. Vice Mayor Welch. Here. And Mayor Bowders. Here. Now is the time to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the final agenda for this meeting? I move approval of the final agenda. Second. Thank you. Motion by Welch, second by Carr to approve agenda. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The agenda has been approved. Are there any ex parte communications for tonight's meeting? He Hearing and seeing none, we'll move to public comment. Public comment for consent items or items not on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to comment have two minutes to do so. Are there any hands raised? Seeing none, the public comment is now closed. Turn to the consent calendar. We have one item on the consent calendar. Is there any questions, comments, or wish to discuss the consent calendar item? Seeing and hearing none, I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar. I move the uh, consent calendar. I'll second the uh, motion. Thank you. Motion by Welch, second by Carr to approve the agenda. I'm sorry, approve the calendar. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Batters. Aye. The agenda has been approved. The calendar has been approved. It's adjourned. 7 16. 7.16 p.m. I'd like to call to order the City of Emeryville successor agency to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency. As was noted, this is a hybrid meeting. As was previously noted, all members remain present, Madam Clerk. This time I'll entertain a motion to approve this agenda. I move approval of the agenda. Second. Thank you. Motion by Welch, second by Carr to approve agenda. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye, it's approved. Item five is public comment for the consent items or items that are not on this agenda. Any members of the public wishing to speak for the consent agenda for the redevelopment agency have two minutes to do so. Seeing no people present, no hands raised, public comment is closed. We'll turn to the consent calendar. There are two items, warrants and action minutes. Are there any comments, questions, or members who wish to discuss? Seeing and hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I move consent. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Welch and a second by Carr to approve the consent calendar. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The consent calendar is approved. There are no action items. Madam Clerk, the time is 717. That meeting is adjourned. The time is 717. I call to order the City Council of the City of Emeryville's regular meeting for Tuesday, June 20th, 2023. And please note that this meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the public can join us at City Hall or via Zoom. Madam Clerk, please note all members remain present for this meeting. This time I'll take a motion to approve this agenda. I'll move approval of this agenda. I second. Thank you. Motion by Carr, second by Welch to approve agenda. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Councilmember Mora. Aye. Councilmember Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The agenda being approved, we'll move to item four, special orders of the day. Item 4.1 is a legislative briefing from our assembly member, Mia Bonta. I would like to invite and welcome our honorable assembly member for our district to the podium to provide a presentation on the legislative overview of her work on behalf of us and the constituents of Emeryville and the Capitol. Good evening, Madam Assemblywoman. Thank you. It's so great to be with you all today, this evening. I am so proud to be able to say I get to represent the city of Emeryville in 8018. Uh, it's a great honor to be a, a new part of this, and I want to say thank you to my dear friends on the Emeryville City Council. Thank you for your commitment to serving our collective constituents uh, here in this amazing, vibrant city. And I've been so impressed by Emeryville in this short time uh, during the redistricting. And I want to particularly thank Mayor Bowders for the orientation and tour and the staff uh, who came out uh, to be with my staff and team uh, and were with me in the very first days of my uh, term in the district. and. Uh, and was just really a representative beginning to what I think is going to be an um, amazing partnership. And I want to thank as uh, uh, council member uh, Welch for uh, also inviting me to housing and planning meetings early on to just give me a, a really good feel for what Emeryville is all about. 
Um, and uh, I just want to say that during that time, I've, I've, during this time, I've seen the amazing strides that this council has taken, particularly on housing justice, criminal justice reform, transportation, and advancing key climate initiatives. I call Emeryville the little jewel of California uh, because you are punching way above your weight in so many different ways. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that you've been able to pull together and that I call attention to a lot in the assembly because of the work that you've done here. And it's because of the council leadership, your collaborative spirit, and the way that you're able to work together in such innovative ways that's really quite powerful. And as assembly member, I've served since September 2021. And this is by way of update to just kind of talk about some of the important uh, measures that I've been able to carry through the first legislate, my first legislative session and to update uh, our collective community about what is going on in Sacramento and tied to what's happening here in Emeryville. So during the 2021-2022 legislative session, 10 of my bills were chaptered and signed into law to support our neighborhoods, businesses, and residents. And as a member of the Legislative Black Caucus, the Legislative Women's Caucus, the Latino Legislative Caucus, and the Progressive Caucus, I am committed to working with my colleagues to push forward progressive policy and agenda as we move forward. Uh, some of my key priorities in that first legislative session were accomplished not through legislation, but through budget action, including Literacy for All, which uh, awarded uh, hundreds of millions of dollars towards family lit of literacy in particular. It Takes a Village, which was a $13 million grant to focus on place-based uh, cradle-to-career initiatives and establishing an Office of Gun Violence Prevention. One of the first bills, AB 252, which uh, was a floating homes marina bill, ensured that tenant residents and families that live in floating homes at the marina are protected by the Bay Area's skyrocketing prices of price of living. And this will support marina tenants and residents to remain housed and prevent predatory pricing as one of the last remaining affordable housing communities to remain. This bill sunsets in 2030, and I'm committed to protecting this community moving forward. I also wanted to uh, worked on AB 2750, which is legislation that would act, uh, advocate for uh, historically marginalized communities by directing the California Department of Technology to create a state digital equity plan to identify barriers to digital equity. And now in 2023, I have unapologetically led legislation that will continue to uplift our most vulnerable communities, not only in our district, but throughout the state of California. Two weeks ago, we had our marathon assembly floor session and 12 of my bills moved on to the Senate. They are going through policy committees right now and hopefully many of them will hit the Senate floor in a, a few weeks time. And I'm continuing to uplift the life and legacy in that work of our beloved supervisor Wilma Chan with my version of food as medicine. Uh, this is something that she focused on in Alameda County, specifically AB 1644. So it requires medical plans to offer medically supportive food and nutrition as a covered benefit. AB 1644 would improve health outcomes and provide proactive and preventative health care costs. Currently, it is an optional benefit offered by some, but not all, and medical plans, uh, medical plans in Alameda County. While this bill was held in appropriations due to cost, I am committed to carrying on her legacy and will continue to this fight um, and ensure that this bill gets passed and reintroduced in, in future years. A few bills that I am making a uh, high priority for me and walking through the Senate right now, I wanted to uplift uh, AB 793, a landmark bill to protect people seeking reproductive and gender affirming care by prohibiting the use of geofencing and keyword reverse warrants that infiltrate and reveal uh, our personal information. AB 793 is making California the leading sanctuary state for reproductive and gender affirming care during this new post row era. Uh, AB 1104, uh, my Pathway to Community-Based Transformation Act, seeks to clarify sentencing uh, is for rehabilitation and reentry and not uh, to inflict further punishment uh, and continue to get people uh, out of our carceral system because 85% of people who go into prison come out of prison and we want them to be able to be fully rehabilitated and to have opportunity to reenter. AB 1186 focuses on youth restitution, which addresses economic inequities for families who have the least financial means to pay to put an end to the harmful cycle of poverty and youth incarceration. And I'm looking uh, to make sure that victims are made whole by providing a pathway for restitution 
uh, from the Victim Compensation Board. Also working closely with the Green Lining Institute, I am very proud to work on AB 1525, which seeks to require a minimum of 60% of transportation funds that would flow through the various state agencies and state funding, forces, state funding sources to be allocated uh, to priority highly impacted population communities, which would include Emeryville. And I would like to share a couple of legislative items around housing specifically. Uh, I know that that is a deep passion of this uh, council. Uh, first, AB 1661 would streamline ADU ins installation by allowing the ADU to be on a master meter, creating more housing units, protecting tenants, and providing uh, cities a pathway to exceed their housing element. We were already doing that, but uh, another opportunity to continue to do that. Uh, second, AB 846, which attempts to place a rent cap on units funded by the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit, the LIHTC dollars, which uh, with various community-based organizations and nonprofit support. We'll need to bring this uh, around in next legislative cycle because we need to make sure that we're getting the rent cap right uh, with all the stacked funding that happens for uh, LIHTC developers in particular. Before coming to an end of my presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about the California state budget. So to put into context, California this year will pass the second largest budget in California's history. Uh, that doesn't mean that it, we don't have a close to 30 uh, million above, 30 billion and above uh, deficit in, uh, in the amount of revenues that we projected. So I can proudly say that despite all that, I will continue to unapologetically fight uh, to ensure that we uh, focus on uh, public transportation agencies facing the financial crisis that we're in due to the decline in ridership since the height of COVID-19. Uh, and we have successfully secured a budget allocation of $5.1 billion to ensure continued BART and AC transit services without disruption. Uh, as we continue to work with the governor's administration on the final set bu state budget, uh, which we're getting close to a third party, three party agreement any day now, I remain committed to further investments in and not cuts around childcare systems of our public schools and investments in uh, homelessness and housing to be able to support what we know we need to and transportation. And further, I wanna continue to push the allocation of state funding and grants for local city, county and county agencies and community-based organizations and nonprofits to address neighborhood needs and provide essential services to meet their basic needs as a human right. I had the opportunity uh, to submit several district specific priorities for consideration for funding. I submitted the request uh, to ensure that we included the city's uh, 40th street corridors improvement projects uh, that will help create protected bike lanes and protect, protect pedestrian safety. And I submitted the request for the full 9 million because despite what the budget deficit is, this is a high priority for you. And so it's a high priority for me. And I remain hopeful that we will be able to get that done. And thank you so much for the time and for the work that you do and for the partnership that I know we have already started to enjoy and will continue to enjoy over the years. And uh, just wanna uh, applaud you all for, again, being a shining star. And uh, I'm very proud to be able to represent the city of Emeryville. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. I'll um, open it for uh, members of the council who'd like to ask questions on anything that was shared or make remarks or say anything. I Vice Mayor Welch. Just thank you for coming here in person and being able to see you and um, just giving us updates on what's going on and just letting us know your priorities and thank you for the partnership. Councilmember Cora. I echo uh, Vice Mayor's comments. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblywoman Bonta. I really appreciate your being here and also appro getting approved for our nine million <laughs> project. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. Member Pry first. I just wanted to say uh, thank you for your leadership uh, as it relates to, I'm a product um, of the Promise neighborhoods uh, out of New York. And, uh, and so Oakland Promise, and also um, the leadership of Libby Schaff, you know, as a mayor, she really helped to uh, really push to make that happen as well. Um, and, uh, and so I don't know if you've heard, but we're trying to do sort of an Emeryville promise. And so uh, thanks to the, the team at our uh, community services, um, we are, um, we're, we're currently exploring that. And so thank you for your leadership in, in making that uh, regional. 
Um, and um, and if Governor Newsom doesn't recognize how awesome that is, well, that's on him. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. I uh, actually have a, a select committee on, it's got a really long name, but it's supposed to be Promised Neighborhoods, but they wouldn't let me call it that. It's like the Select Committee on Coordinated Care and Services or um, something to that effect. And uh, I think it's wonderful that uh, you all are focusing in on that effort and please call on me uh, as you develop out that vision. Councilmember Moore, did you have any comments or questions for the Assemblywoman? Uh, no specific comments. I just echo the comments of my colleagues. I appreciate you uh, coming to the, the chambers and providing these updates. Thank you. And uh, Madam Assemblymember, I just want to thank you for uh, diving in headfirst on all the issues so important to this district as you opened housing, criminal justice reform, transportation, socioeconomic equity, education access. These are, these are the issues that this district really cares about. And as uh, somebody who serves in a local capacity but also works professionally um, with leaders like yourself at the state level, it's very refreshing and um, reassuring to have a person like you representing us who understands the lived experience of people in our community who has been in this community uh, for a long time here in the East Bay and really um, has your pulse on, has the pulse on what's going on. I just also wanna give a really special um, uh, statement of appreciation for your uh, efforts to continue the legacy of Wilma Chan. Uh, I know she's a fellow Alamedan to you, um, but as somebody who has uh, lived through uh, food insecurity and uh, been in the human services space professionally for a very long time. I uh, always felt a very deep uh, debt of gratitude to Wilma for her outspoken leadership, both at the state level and here in the county on uh, health, human services, and in particular food security. So I am also just deeply grateful that you are continuing that legacy of leadership here from our district. Thank you for your service. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I did just wanna end by saying one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, is our district team uh, that really focuses on constituent services. Uh, so just wanted to kind of give a shout out to all those who are listening here, um, that you are my constituents and our, our office's constituent. And when you are experiencing issues of concern where there is an intersection between the state uh, and state agencies and you believe that we might be able to be of service, please call your assembly member and uh, we have people ready and primed and very skilled at being able to help uh, help you. We've helped in EDD cases and um, a lot of the issues related to uh, the, uh, the housing moratorium and eviction moratorium that we are f facing right now. And so please call on us and we'll be there. Thank and you. I, I will just uh, reiterate for the public that are listening or watching at home that the Assemblywoman has the best staff. They are the best. I uh, have spent a lot of time with them um, in a group and uh, in one-on-ones, and you have some of the most amazing staff. So I would just second that. If you need something that the state can offer, um, please do not hesitate to reach out to her office. Thank you. I appreciate you all and the time. Thank have you. Have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us today. We'll um, take public comment on item four as the special order of the day because the assemblywoman was here. Um, I'll recognize Brian Donahue for two minutes, please. Yeah, I just, uh, is this special, is this comment just for the, for uh, the um, assembly member Bonta's? Uh, yes, this um, is special orders of the day, sure. yes. Yeah, I wanted to, to let uh, assembly member Bonta know, first off, I live in Emeryville, so you are my assemblywoman. <clears throat> and I want you to know that a specific council member, the one that you know, and that would be Vice Mayor Courtney Welsh, has a Twitter account. And on her Twitter account, public Twitter account, she called me a fuck boy, literally a fuck boy. And she said that because I called her a corporate Democrat because of her. Uh, uh, her, uh, her, her pro Yimby, uh, sort of, you know, shameless pro Yimby <clears throat> advocacy. She's not advocating for housing, you know, housing. Uh, she's you know, basically pro uh, pro developer. So I I mentioned that on my on my news site, the Emeryville Tattler, and she called me a fuck boy. So that's pretty impolitic. And I don't think uh, Assemblymember Bonta, you would approve of that, but I thought you should know that 
since you were just praising Councilwoman uh, Welch so much, so highly, you should know that that's how she treats uh, some uh, constituents that uh, disagree with her. Fuck boy. Thank you very much. Are there any written comments for this item, April? No, Mayor, there are not. That concludes item 4.1. Have a lovely e evening, Madam Assemblymember Gelser. Have a great evening. Take care. Okay, that'll move to item five, which is announcements of uh, commission and committee vacancies. Madam Clerk. Mayor and Council, just wanted to remind you that we have a um, application process open. It closes on uh, Monday, June 26th. We have 33 total vacancies and we've received 18 applications at this point. Through June 26th, we said? Yes, Monday, June 26th at 5 p.m. Applications available on the website. Okay, so members of the public interested in serving on a resident committee, you have an opportunity to serve the community right now. If you'd like to apply, please go to the City of Emeryville's website and go to the clerk's page. Or is it on? Is there a link on the left for committees? Is what it's on? Yeah, it's on the left. Member Pryforce. Uh, Madam Clerk, when was the last time that was posted on Twitter or our social media? Uh, we have a reminder going out at the end of the week, and then we do one on Monday also. But we, okay. I, I think actually we could do it tomorrow Wouldn't as a reminder, and then and then one last push on Monday. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. okay, item six is council member special announcements or reports on meetings and attendance. I'll start with member Carr. Do you have any that you'd like to report on? Meetings? None. A member Mora, do you have any that you'd like to report on? Uh, no special meeting. Okay, member Pryforce. I just want to uh, thank um, our, uh, our municipal leaders in uh, cities like Oakland, Berkeley, Hayward, uh, and so many others for their amazing uh, Pride events and their amazing uh, Juneteenth events. And it was great. Um, uh, many of us uh, uh, joined you. And, uh, and so uh, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, for um, doing what you do to organize and, um, and celebrate um, uh, to, uh, w with your communities. Vice Mayor Walsh, do you have anything you'd like to report? None. Okay. Uh, my only report will be that uh, this past week I was in Washington, D.C., uh, representing the Alameda County Transportation Commission um, in meetings with the Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway and Rail Administrations, the Department of Energy, uh, the congressional delegation and the committees that appropriate funds to uh, jurisdictions locally and at the state level for the bipartisan infrastructure and IIJA bills and uh, made pitches for a number of uh, applications we have pending and a couple we're about to submit. We recently received a $15 million grant for San Pablo Avenue. We have a request for a $25 million raise grant, which I hope we'll get a favorable response on uh, for the county next month for the East Bay Greenway. And we may, we're gonna be applying for additional funding for San Pablo Avenue through the Reconnecting Communities Grant Program. It was a very successful trip uh, and be happy to answer any questions from any members of the public about that at a future time. Okay. Item seven, city manager's report. Nothing to report, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Item eight, ex parte communications. Members, take a look at the agenda. If there's an item on this agenda for which you've had a substantive discussion with an applicant or a person party to the contract that you'd like to report as an ex parte communication, please state that for the record now. I'll start with Member Pryforce. Do you have any ex parte communications? No, Mayor. Okay. Member Corr, do you have any communications? No. Okay. Member Mora, do you have any to report? None. Okay, Vice Mayor Welch. Oh, let me get to the end. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> and I have none to report either, Madam Clerk. Uh, we'll move to item nine, public comment for the consent agenda items and items that are not on this agenda. A member of the public looking to make comment for an item not on this agenda or the consent agenda has two minutes to do so. Are there any members of the public present who wish to make comment on the, pub the public comment? Okay, I'll turn to you online. I recognize Brian Donahue for two minutes, please. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, so in, uh, in uh, March, on March 19th of 2023, Mayor John Bowder said on his, his Twitter account, uh, he said, when someone else labels you, Remember that it's usually because they're either incapable of recognizing you as a unique person capable of nuance or because their agenda isn't rooted in a good faith discourse to begin with. 
Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Bowder said that <clears throat> in March, and to that, but and to that, I asked the mayor now, and you can answer. The Brown Act permits you to answer. So, if that being what you believe, why then, Mr. Mayor, did you call me at a, publicly at a meeting? Did you call me an ableist? That's a label. That's something you labeled me with. Ableism. You called me an ableist from the from the dais. So. Given that statement you made in your Twitter account, and you got 95 likes on that, by the way, why, why would you call me an ableist? It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's complete hypocrisy. Further, your colleague Courtney Welsh called me a fuckboy, as I just mentioned to uh, the RSM, and you just sat there and you didn't say anything about it. So there you go, a label. I was labeled as a fuckboy by your, by your friend and colleague, and then of course. Diane Martinez, a member of the Planning Commission, called me a NIMBY from the dais. So, you know, all these labels thrown out by, from on high, down to us peons, us, you know, public speakers and what have you. And it's pretty unseemly, but I just want to know, how do you, how do you uh, justify that? How do you square that with your, your uh, statement you made, Mr. Mayor? Thank you for your comment. March. Thank you. Any other members of the public who wish to comment for items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, public comment is closed. We'll turn to the consent calendar. Mr. Carpio, did you want to comment? You can come up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is André Carpio. I'm a former Emeryville resident. The city uh, uh, wrecked my house and and trashed all my tools and all my machine, everything that I was making an livelihood with, everything was dumped and uh, everything, it, it's just nothing I can do because uh, when you are confronted with uh, five police, Emeryville police with gun on their shoulder, there is nothing you can you can complain about, you know. I guess I'm, I'm still happy to be alive and to tell about it. But that destroy, that, that gave my son a, a real bad feeling. He passed away, by the way. But uh, not on account of that, but other things. But <coughs> it, this is distressful. And, and, and also, what I just heard, that people call each other name. <coughs> uh, what kind of name did you give me? I mean, uh, uh, what, uh, I'm working. It, uh, is it a sin? I mean, I, mean, I don't know. Anybody call me name here? Uh, I'm, I'm just looking around. Maybe uh, it just it, it just hard for me to hear what I heard from uh, Brian Donahue. So um, I really would like the city council to exercise some civility on, on, about treating people. And I've been a victim of that, and not from this council, but the previous council. You know, they raided me, they took my, he took everything that, that I was making, a lively with everything, everything that I do, work with my hand, my machine, and, and all my instruments. So I, I'm sure you would see that, <coughs> like I did, that it was a professional bias a view a view that they did not, did not understand and tolerate people who work on machinery. Thank you so for your comment, Mr. Carpio. Case. Thank you for your but comment. I'm sorry. I was brought up like that. Mr. Carpio, and, um, Mr. Carpio, so, time. We're at time. So, sorry to be, take your time over time. Thank you. I hope you get paid for it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll let him, I'm going to wait for him to put his earphones back on. Okay, we'll turn to the consent calendar. Items 10.1 uh, through 10.10 .10 inclusive are before you for consent. Are there any members who wish to ask questions about items on the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? I move the consent calendar. 
Second. Thank you. Motion by Vice Mayor Welch, second by Council Member Carr to approve the consent calendar. Please call the roll. Council Member Carr? Aye. Council Member Mora? Aye. Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Thank you. We have two public hearings tonight. The first public hearing is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Emeryville adding Chapter 15 to Title IV of the Emeryville Municipal Code. Private parking facilities, CEQA determination is exempt. The presentation will be by Chad Smalley. And welcome, Mr. Smalley. All right. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Chad Smalley, Deputy Director of Community Development, here uh, to talk about an ordinance that would add Chapter 15 to Title IV, entitled Public, uh, Private Parking Facilities. Man, why don't you want to advance? There we go. Going to go over uh, a brief background of how we got to this point, and then I'll walk through the proposed ordinance and close with staff's recommendation and the next steps. So the background on this is back in spring of 2021, uh, Center Cal Properties purchased the Bay Street Shopping Center uh, from UBS and uh, very nearly immediately began investing in the transformation of that center and repositioning it. Those improvements included uh, retenanting and reconfiguring the food terrace, uh, gaining entitlements for a grocery store and, and revamped plaza, uh, and also uh, painting of the buildings and modernization of the parking system, which is the focus of today's discussion. The parking modernization included new meters that would accept park, uh, credit cards, uh, replacing the old coin-based meters. Uh, they engaged a new parking operator to uh, manage their parking, and they replaced the pay gates for the garages with a pay-by-space system, which I'll get into the differences. A pay, uh, Access controlled garages are using gates. Um, they have benefits and drawbacks. The drawbacks are that they're, they're a little less convenient for motorists because you know that you'll be encountering a gate, you have to pull a ticket, you maybe have to stand in line, uh, and then you have to pay that ticket in order to get out of the garage. Um, that can cause some queuing issues during peak hours when it's particularly busy, both in and getting out of the garage. Um, but it minimizes the enforcement costs because the only way you can get in is if you pull a ticket and the only way you can get out is if you paid for that ticket to get up through that gate. In contrast, the gateless systems, are, which are you know, pay by space, where all the spaces are numbered, um, they're more customer friendly because you just drive up and you park and you don't have to deal with waiting in line, you don't have the queuing issues, uh, and then you, you pay um, at a pay station or by an app. And uh, the downside to this is that in order to make sure that people pay, you have to have some kind of enforcement of the interior of the garage. So the way that's accomplished is through what's called mail-in parking charges, which are basically tickets. Um, you want to enforce the parking and not just allow for the free flow of it without paying, because if you don't, People will just overstay. Um, it doesn't allow you to manage the parking for turnover to make sure that spaces are available and appropriately priced. And in the case of Bay Street, um, those revenues that are collected on the paid parking are an important component of the overall operation and maintenance budget for the center. As it turns out, the state uh, law under the California Vehicle Code, or CVC, at 21107.8 has a provision that allows for cities to adopt ordinances that declare that certain private parking facilities are generally held open to the public. And if the city adopts one of these ordinances, certain sections of the California Vehicle Code apply to the facilities um, described in the ordinance. And those ordinances may include uh, and provide for owner enforcement of private parking through mail-in parking charges. So it's an enabling uh, legislation. Center Cal, uh, as part of their parking modernization, has requested that the city adopt an ordinance under 211.07.8 uh, uh, applicable to the Bay Street garages. We took a preliminary draft ordinance to the Budget and Governance Committee uh, in February, and a couple of concerns were raised by that committee. One was regarding driver behavior, undesirable driver behavior, meaning like sideshow type activities or general rowdiness um, in these garages, and whether the removal of the gates would facilitate or encourage that kind of behavior. As I mentioned, um, so we, we looked into this in, as a response to the, the committee's comments. 
Um, and as I mentioned, there are codes in the CVC that will apply to facilities that, um, that are covered by this ordinance, including reckless driving, racing, and, and speeding. In talking with the police department about those sections and about how the CVC generally already applies to pri private parking facilities that are held open to the public, their uh, position is that existing law provides some enforcement tools for them to deal with that kind of behavior regardless and that the CV, this uh, CVC sections would provide them additional tools. And so in combination, they have sufficient authority to deal with any undesirable type of behavior that, that occurs in these kinds of facilities. The second topic raised by the committee was uh, really around fairness and objectivity in applying the enforcement. Uh, the ordinance has a dispute resolution process laid out in general that requires um, uh, written procedures be submitted to the city for approval. And I'll get into this in a little more detail later, uh, but we changed the preliminary draft that we presented to the committee to, uh, to deal with that concern. So an overview of the proposed ordinance. It applies only to the Bay Street garages, not Bay Street proper, uh, just the enclosed areas, as well as the private parking garages, both existing and proposed, and lots at the Marketplace redevelopment. The reason for this is um, when we received this request from Center Cal, staff went out to the major shopping centers, inquired whether this is something they were interested in participating in. Only, uh, other than Center Cal, only um, City Center slash Oxford at uh, Public Market was, was interested in pursuing this uh, for both their future um, garages as well as their existing lots where they do have time limits. The uh, ordinance enables parking operators to enforce through the mail and parking charges. It defines, the ordinance defines unauthorized parking only as the failure to pay or parking beyond the amount of time that was paid for. The mail in charge amount cannot exceed whatever the city's parking citation amounts are. Currently the city's parking citations are $58. We understand that Bay Street intends to uh, charge $30 for a uh, mail in parking charge and at Marketplace is $43. Uh, signage obviously is required that complies with very specific provisions in the CVC about notifying drivers that this charge could be assessed to them. And this, the notice of charge, that is the actual envelope that's put on the car, has to be clearly differentiated and is spelled out in the ordinance from the city's. We don't want folks to be confused about whether it's the city's ticket or whether it's being issued by the private parking operator. The dispute resolution process I alluded to earlier, and I'll go into it in a little more detail here. If someone gets a mail-in parking charge and they feel like, wait, I, I paid, or that's not right, they can request an initial review, it's free, and they can do that within 21 days of being issued the, uh, the mail-in charge. They are required to receive a response within 30 days uh, of, of receipt of that request by the parking operator, and the operator can just dismiss the charge, yes, we made a mistake, or say, no, you did park over time or there was a violation and provide the reasons for upholding the charge as well as instructions for how to request an appeal or an administrative hearing on that uh, citation or that mail-in parking charge. The request for administrative uh, hearing, folks would pay the amount as part of the request uh, and that uh, is to occur within 21 days. You have to request the hearing after getting the, the initial determination. There also has to be written procedures explained uh, to folks uh, how they can request hardship request basically for allowing a hearing to happen without paying the charge. That hearing is to take place within 90 days of the request either by mail or in person at the requester's option, that is the person that received the charge. And that uh, hearing is to be conducted by a trained qualified examiner that's independent of the parking operator. That final decision uh, is then mailed with the reasons if it's denied um, or obviously if it's overturned a refund. Operators, um, in order to avail themselves of this ordinance, have to register with the city and the city has to approve the written procedures. All of that stuff that I just explained about dispute resolution has to be written out in a, in a set of dispute resolution procedures that gets submitted to the city. Uh, in that, they have to provide for objective, fair, impartial reviews. The city may, and this is where we address the, the committee's concern, the city, if the city gets 
receives evidence that this ordinance is not being applied fairly or objectively, the city may rescind its approval of those procedures. And at that point, no longer can the parking operator issue mail-in parking charges, not until they've corrected uh, in writing the issue and, uh, and have gained reapproval by the city for, for their new process. This ordinance is modeled after similar ordinances. Uh, areas uh, around us that have this same kind of ordinance are, include Walnut Creek, uh, Lafayette, and Pleasant Hill. There are some slight differences between what we have proposed and those ordinances, uh, predominantly around uh, the scope of unauthorized parking. As I mentioned in the beginning, this only applies if you stay over time or didn't pay. In those other cities, they have slightly wider scopes of what is called unauthorized parking, meaning if you parked in a loading zone or on a red curb or you generally blocked people or something like that. Uh, the other, provision, the other uh, difference is that we don't have late fee provisions in this ordinance. Uh, those other cities that are on the screen do. Uh, it was uh, city attorney's advice that um, to us not to include these two wider scope of unauthorized parking and late fee provisions um, to uh, uh, avoid the risk of challenge, legal challenge of this ordinance. So in closing, staff recommends uh, that the city uh, council hold, its, hold a public hearing and then waive first reading and introduce by title only. Uh, should you do that, uh, the next steps would be a second reading on July 5th. This ordinance wouldn't become effective until uh, 30 days hence, which is August 4th uh, of this year. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. I know that we have folks on the phone from both, uh, I believe, from both City Center and from Center Cal, and we also have uh, Center Cal's parking operator here with us today if you have questions that are more appropriate or specific to them. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Hey, the only, uh, before we take public comment, uh, the only question I have is, do, are we expecting a presentation by any of them? I'm not assuming that, no. right? Okay, so we'll just take their comments as part of public comment. So this is a public hearing. Uh, Madam Clerk, the time is 7.56. The public hearing is now open. All members of the public who wish to comment on the public hearing for agenda item 11.1 will have two minutes to do so. I'll recognize Brian Donahue first, please, for two minutes. Okay, you should definitely not do this. Why? Because Emeryville will be working for Bay Street Corporation, whatever the name of it is. We will be using our tax dollars and our resources and our time to, to help the profit motive of the Bay Street Corporation. This is not something a public agency, agency should be doing. Okay, unless Emeryville gets all the proceeds from the tickets, then I say, sure, let's do it. But it sounds like it's not going to be the case so no don't do this we don't, we don't we're not here to work for bay street corporation okay and then and then secondly i wanted to say this will not be applied fairly or equitably because this is we're talking about this is bay street bay street corporation every time i look into anything that they're doing i find that they're doing it something illegally like like for 22 years they're driving their 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 uh, cars their little security cars without licenses or registration or proof of insurance for 22 years they were doing it. Finally, they, they took them off our street uh, because I complained. But and then they're renting out public parking spots for vendors. They, these, this is a scamming corporation. They're going to screw this up. Don't do it. The last thing I wanted to say, if if the way that it works right now, parkers do not have to pay because there's a, a private dispute between two uh, private parties, and you don't have to pay. I just got my my wife just got a ticket there, and I'm not going to pay. And you know, if they want if they want their money, they can take me to court. Um, but only do this if Emeryville collects all the money. Otherwise, we are working now for corporations. I mean, that that is really a horrible place for us to be. It's already we are already so pro corporate corporation in Emeryville. I hate the idea of us actually now working directly materially for your for comment. Corporations. Okay, the next speaker will be Cassandra K. please. Two minutes. Hello, 
Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Cassandra. I'm with City Center Realty Partners, I'm the general manager at Public Market Emeryville. And I just wanted to um, speak in favor of this ordinance to preserve par parking for the patrons of the food hall. The food hall, as everyone knows, is comprised of many small businesses. We also have other small business retailers at the site, and all of those entities would greatly benefit by this ordinance. So we're in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public who have not yet spoken that wish to speak on this item? Okay, seeing and hearing none, Madam Clerk, the time is 7.59. The public hearing is adjourned and closed. And I will turn back to the council for further discussion and deliberation. Are there any council members who wish to give comment? Recognize council member Mora first, please. Um, I just had a question about, um, I'm wondering what's changed with regard to the prepaid parking. Um, Cause I know there's been prepaid parking at Bay Street for uh, at least over 20 years, I believe, in the northern uh, parking lot, there were um, meters there. Um, how come, what's, uh, why do we need something different um, when the, this is prepaid parking has been in place? Is there somebody who can speak to that from uh, Center Cal? I think, yeah, uh, Chad, would you like somebody else to answer that question or do you need more additional information? Um, I would like clarity on if the council member is referring to the metered spaces on the first floor of the north parking structure? Yes. Yes. Okay, that, make, that makes sense. If, um, uh, yeah, if someone from Center Cal or Park Smart might be better positioned to um, I, I it's my understanding that that doesn't change the way those are enforced is still through meters instead of pay by space but it's still prepaid right it's a similar concept somebody gets a ticket there it's been however that plays out it's been that way for 20 years introduce yourself please hi there my name is daniel toth i'm from park smart I uh, just want to say thank you guys for having us and for putting together the ordinance and all the work the staff has done on it. Uh, to answer your question, council member, those meters, the operation hasn't changed. I believe we actually reduced the number of meters that were in that garage and introduced some mobile payment that people can pay on their phones. The prepaid portion is the same. The main difference here is that now the entirety of the property is prepaid parking. I believe there's around 3,000 spaces, and the spaces that you're referring to are approximately 100 of those. So the remaining 2,000 plus spaces are now prepaid, and that's the biggest difference for why this ordinance is needed. Councilmember Moore, do you have follow-up questions for the uh, member, who, the man who just spoke? Well, maybe just drilling into that. What what was the what was parking were those tickets that were what was the parking enforcement taking place in that subset of spaces was that not working for 20 years yeah so that the lower level of the e-garage and i'm not actually sure if center cal can speak to this more um i'm actually not sure that they were being enforced they were there and i think people were paying yeah, they them. were i've gotten tick i've gotten tickets there they were enforced do you know where you uh I've received paid, those prepaid i've paid tickets do you know what uh, entity off, um, cited you or provided those I, tickets? I do, I do not. Okay. I, I don't know the entity, no. Okay. Yeah, sorry, prior to Park Smart's operation, I'm actually not sure how it was enforced in the past. I'm going to recognize um, Isamar Hook from Bay, Bay Street and Center Cal. Please recognize her as, uh, to respond to the question. Good evening, Isamar. Good evening, Mayor Rodgers. Thank you, Danny. Awesome. Um, so the particular reason um, that we need to have this uh, this uh, ordinance changed is because we have to have a method of which to enforce them uh, via a ticket. And although you may have received a ticket previously in that e-meter garage, it wasn't enforceable um, with the formal ordinance. And this ordinance would make it enforceable. How does the ordinance make it enforceable? I thought it just means you get to mail people. I, I, you can still put a ticket on their windshield, right? 
That's correct. You can still get a physical ticket. Um, and Danny, do you want to mention the process? Yeah, the process sorry. Sorry about that. I misunderstood your question, council member. Uh, so the current process, you're not given a ticket. It's essentially an all day rate charge. And by prepaying for parking, you're paying for a discount from that all day rate charge. If you don't prepay for parking, then you're assessed the all day rate charge, which is currently set at $30. The ordinance follows the state law that was passed and puts the restrictions into place that Mr. Smalley mentioned. It does a lot more, um, there's a lot better restrictions and clearer language that makes it easier to understand for the public. And then also lets the city dictate and actually approve whether or not they feel like we're doing a, a good job with our dispute procedures and some of the other things that need to be uh, approved. So it takes the current process that we're doing and it formalizes it. Um, it sort of subjects us to more review by the city. Sorry, I think I'm still just confused. You, you put the ticket on someone's windshield. What, what does it matter if they keep receiving reminders in the mail or I guess increased fines? So the, the mail-in parking charge is essentially the ticket that you're referring to. What goes on the windshield is by name the mail-in parking charge. It's the customer that mails it in. It's not being mailed to them. Sorry, is that the confusion? Yeah, but what's the, the enforce? Sorry, how's the enforceability different? That's maybe that I'm not following that correctly. So, sorry, the enforceability um, isn't different. It's really the procedures around it that's now governed by the ordinance that falls under the state law that has a lot more structure than the current uh, practice of using an all day rate that you pay for a discount off of. So it's a, it's a similar practice, but the ordinance creates the procedures that we have to follow and um, gives the customer a better idea of what to expect and outlines the expectations of everyone. Okay, thanks. Other members who have questions? Member Pryforce? So um, who are you? I mean, you introduced yourself, but who are you in relationship to Bay Street? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm uh, I'm Daniel Toth from ParkSmart. ParkSmart Inc. is the operator that Bay Street Emeryville uses to uh, operate their parking. Okay, so you're the vendor. Yes, we're the okay. vendor. Okay, got it. Okay, so what we're dealing with, and I I can actually hear uh, in uh, Councilmember Moore, my colleague's uh, voice, a, a bit of the confusion. And what I'm concerned about is that um, I, when, I, when I reviewed this over the agenda, I thought this was a, kind of a simple, I had most, some concerns about the pricing uh, the, in terms of the fees uh, compared to the city's fees. Uh, but now I have some concerns in terms of usability. Um, and I want to get this right because um, there's a whole, not a whole lot that we do here that affects my 15-year-old uh, daughter. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but this one... The last thing I want is for her to look at me and go, you approve this, you know? And so, um, and, and I think it's really important to make the distinction between Bay Street and Bay Street's relationship with the city, with the, what Bay Street is asking, um, uh, so does Bay Street and Senecal, uh, and then also your product, right? And so, uh, so from a product uh, usability, um, right now when I am, you know, because my daughter usually leaves, you know, and she's going to kill me for exposing her like this. She usually uh, forgets her glasses or she uh, forgets uh, something. Uh, and so when we get to the parking lot uh, in order to catch that, um, you know, the, the, the latest Spider-Verse movie, uh, the, the issue is that uh, we have to, we usually get to the, uh, uh, to, the base, uh, to AMC, and then we go, oh, God, we forgot the parking number, right? And then we have to go back down and look at the parking number. Now, why is this important? It's because from a product development stand, standpoint, um, Bay, Street, Bay Street has, and I, and I remember sending um, uh, the, the, the city manager and I ran into one of my neighbors who, um, who, is, uh, who, who is in a wheelchair 
and they can't get par past that part of the sidewalk uh, because there's a light, I think, in front of uh, uh, that putty, putty, the putty uh, place. Um, there's, a, there's a light that's there, right? And so, um, so already from my vantage point as a, a longtime resident of Emeryville and a longtime res resident of Emeryville, and so I'm judging um, uh, Bay Street by not being, I believe, the best community steward. Anything that Bay Street does tends to be uh, for for uh, Bay Street. Um, and also knowing that my neighbor has had this experience, so no one actually walked the sidewalk and thought, hey, let's think about um, wheelchair access and whether or not we're blocking something from, from other people. And, and, uh, and if we did communicate to Bay Street about that and it's still there, then, um, then that, that's what I'm concerned about is that your product may need not just a presentation that we'll probably will see from, from a, uh, some sort of slideshow, but maybe some of us as council members to so actually you walk us through this process, set up a mock enforcer and, and let us know uh, going in and out, like what the experience is going to be. And because that's the experience that our, uh, our neighbors are going to have. And when I wanna make sure that um, from a product, fr product you know, sort of you know, means test that uh, that um, sort of A-B testing that you, you guys have really thought about what the experience is because this probably would have, even the issue of the parking number, if y'all if just raised the, num uh, the, um, the number of the parking spot, right? Like, so, so we not, we're not having to actually look down and look at the parking spot or make sure that the car isn't blocking the park, you know, and that sort of thing, right? And so there's just some missteps when it comes to actual user testing and, and actual people, what, they, what their experience is. And so, um, and I can hear it in my, my, my colleague's voice, and that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about that we will, um, that we will you know, through this process, um, that it, it stays on paper and it's not actually the lived experience of what it is. And so, uh, so during this process, um, uh, this approval process, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see too big of an issue of it in terms of the uh, collaboration and relationship. It's just I want to make sure that you include something like that um, so that we get an idea of what will be the actual experience of those who will be going through. Uh, uh, going through this, even if it's a, even a matter of, well, what happens if somebody has a bad cell phone signal? Like, what happens with somebody, you know, because you are in a parking structure, right? And so what happens, you know, like all, all these different questions. Um, I, I mean, that would be great. Are, are there any other members who have questions or comments? Member Core? Yes, there is a, an aspect of the convenience, I think. Is this... Uh, First of all, I think it may already be in place, this, this procedure, because I do remember uh, my colleague, M Member Mora, he, what he said, that's what I would do. I would just prepay and um, go and get my shopping done and go back to my car. I wouldn't have to remember any num numbers. And recently when I went there, I saw that I had to change my whole routine I went thinking that I would be prepaying, and then a, a nice lady, in, in, she, she told me, make sure you remember the number, because we had to go all around to look for a car and remember the number, and we wasted so much time, and it was inconvenient. So just from a convenience perspective, this doesn't seem something that would serve the residents of Emeryville. So, and I have to, I have to say that I did like the, um, the procedure that was in place before. It was much more convenient, and it was le less costly even based on this present presentation to enforce. Um, so um, I am a little, yeah, uh, I'm a little confused as to why we need this ordinance at this end. I also, the question I actually have is about the history. Who is the person who initiated this ordinance and what was the reason for that and how did it come about? Mr. Smalley. I can take the last question. Um, so as I mentioned, Senator Cal approached us with, with the request with regard to their, their overall parking modernization. I wanna be clear though that 
these these charges are being issued today. This it, this if you overstay at Bay Street, you'll get an envelope on your window. The same thing will happen at Public Market. If you and although you don't pay at Public Market, if you overstay in the lot, you can get a ticket. You get a ticket from Douglas, and uh, that's their parking operator. And it's our position that right now those aren't enforceable. They, because we have not adopted this ordinance to allow for private enforcement of those lots. So what we're trying to do is make it so that they are enforceable and they're lined up and they're, and they're able to actually run these parking programs that they've already started. And uh, this is Issa Marahook. I'm sorry, I have not, I'm sorry, I have not recognized you. Do not speak unless I've called okay. on you, please. I've recognized Vice Mayor Welch. So Chad, just to clarify, the ordinance is only about the enforceability of the overstaying where whatever they might be getting ticketed for. It is just, it's not about the functionality of the actual, which I don't necessarily agree or disagree with anyone's concerns about the functionality and the convenience, but this is just about being able for Douglas or Park Smart to enforce whatever parking violations they've been ticketed for within those parking garages. Yes, narrowly That's, as defined by this ordinance. So okay. only if you've overstayed time or didn't you didn't follow the time or you stayed over or you didn't pay or you didn't stay for as long as you paid for, or you stayed longer than you paid for, those are defined as parking violations and this allows them to issue a mail-in parking charge. Uh, if if that occurs, this does not mandate or or speak to the technology that they use about how how they do it. Uh, and I apologize because I may have confused the matter by talking about gateless and all of this stuff. What I'm getting at there is that you you have to have if you go away from a gated system, this you have to have some way of enforcing the time limits, and this is the way you do it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Recognize Councilmember Mora. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, add. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, and maybe summarize. I do. I do hear where um, Council Member Carr and Council Member Pryforce are coming from. Uh, and just to kind of um, expand a little bit, um, I, I've so I've left less of an issue with the ordinance itself than having the city essentially provide its blessing to a potentially bad implementation. Um, and there's two things I want to highlight with this, and maybe this is specific to Park Smart. Um, you know, I, I had, I actually have an outstanding ticket in the garage uh, because I didn't understand the system. I was running late taking my kids to see the Mario movie, and uh, we got into the movie. We saw a two hour movie, and I got a $36 ticket, right? Because I didn't have time to install the app and figure out all the details, upload my license plate number, and all of that. The next time I came back, I, um, well, and actually at that time, I actually tried to dispute the ticket. I don't remember being able to get a hold of anybody. Out of curiosity, I called again to explain what I thought was a rather sympathetic situation. Uh, you know, I don't aspire to be any sort of scoff law. And uh, I got a voicemail box. I called at 11 o'clock this morning. So I, I'm concerned that maybe Park Smart is not set up to provide the level of customer service that I think deserves the city's blessing. Um, Maybe, maybe a silver lining to all of this, the next time I went there, I actually did pay uh, the ticket because I figured out the app on my own time. Uh, and, or I, sorry, I paid the, it prepaid the parking and it, and it w went rather smoothly. So I think there is a learning curve uh, and maybe people are le learning, albeit slowly. Uh, and I did also find out that my wife had been there on her own. She could not figure out the parking system I explained it to her. I gave her the app, so I, you, she may or may not have another uh, have a parking ticket associated with that. So uh, perhaps uh, you know this is something that as people learn, they might uh, begin to better negotiate. But as private individuals with the whoever the operator is, if Center Cal retains Park Smart and their uh, level of customer service and implementation. So those those are my two comments on that. Recognize Council Member Kaur. Chad, I appreciate you clarifying that it is, uh, it is 
the way of enforcement. But the present, the gated system, I do actually recognize the merit of you putting it in there, that what we have currently is the gated system. So no, we don't. No, we. Oh, that, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. They took out the gates already. Oh, they already, already yeah. without the ordinance being approved, Correct. they took out the gates. Correct. The ordinance has no has no bearing on bearing the gates, on that. though. That's not the that's not the, the matter. Can I can I intervene at this point? Please, I, yeah. I, I I would like to just clarify this because I don't think it's been made clear. So, the the current the prior system was one of essentially. Um, Tickets were issued, but there was no legal enforceability behind the issuance of a ticket. So it didn't matter which system was used, whether it was pay at the gate, pay at the stall number, pay via an app. It was irrelevant as a system because they would give you a, the, you'd either pay one way or the other, whether you're paying one way or the other, it didn't matter. If you got a ticket, whatever the ticket was for, you were paying it basically voluntarily. You didn't know that. But there was no way that if you challenged it, they could legally make you pay it. So like Councilmember Morris ticket, he doesn't have to pay it. They can't legally do anything about that right now. So go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I actually understood that part. I understood that part. But to me, the, the fact is the vendor made these changes without you know, considering, taking into consideration all these things that they may overstay and now we have to charge them extra and we, we'd have to send them the mail and ticket. Whereas they were, they were, um, they were the gates in place. They were all these measures in place where they wouldn't have gotten out without paying the complete, uh, which would have been more convenient for everyone, for the vendor, for the people in the city who don't have to get this extra app. So I actually recognize that what is happening now is post facto, that they want to enforce this because they have made these changes and now they want the city to follow uh, what is convenient for them, not what is convenient or has been convenient for the city, which I think is not very customer driven to the city to member Mora's point. So I would say that the, if you want to collect that, put the gates back or put whatever was in place back. So the only thing I'll say just to be clear is that they, they have made, you're correct that they made the decision as an infrastructure item but there were other conveniences that they were taking into account is what I heard in the presentation, which was lines of people queuing inside the garage to pay on the way out, lines of people queuing to get in. I'm gonna finish, please. And th that combination of that led to them deciding that that type of system was not actually leading people to use the garage or it was not um, conducive to business operations. And so they made a decision that, yes, to your point, was in their interest. I'm not disagreeing with you about that, but I, I would just say it's the offset of the conveniences they, they chose to make. And I think there's also just a reflection of the modernization of parking enforcement. Listen, as a person who doesn't drive and has never used any of these garages, I have zero horse in this race and I don't know, I haven't gotten a ticket in my entire life, so I don't have any idea what Councilmember Moore's experience is like. But I will just say that that being said, um, you know, the the reality is that when you go down the streets now, you see in like Berkeley and other cities, there's green signs, park, there's a five digit number sometimes or whatever, use an app. So it may be that this experience, what I'm hearing him say is like it wasn't intuitive or that people didn't have an app or whatever. So there may be implementation issues that don't, uh, that aren't customer friendly or not, you know, the most conducive to immediate use. But it does, the sense I have just as an observer is that there is a movement towards, you know, removing gates and, and arms and giving people the ability on their own time to do this. And that this is the enforcement, that the enforcement mechanism is now this other type of ticketing system if you don't pay. Um, and in making this change, they're looking to have enforceability with it for transparency. I'm going to allow you to briefly respond before I go to the vice mayor. I, you, I, I think I understand what you are saying, but again, because I do drive a car. The thing is, what I was trying to say to you is this queuing issue is something I've never seen when I've when I've been there. I've never seen a queuing issue, and I've I do go to the mall. I'm not there every single day. I, I I do admit I'm not there every single day. I'm there frequently. I'm there frequently enough to know that I've never seen a queuing issue. 
So this mystifies me as to why this is even something that's a concern. Um, I, I don't know how, how often you go there, but I don't, I mean, if you have seen a queuing issue, I would have no reason to doubt you. I haven't um, seen it since they removed the gates. I have seen it before. Yeah, as before I did. frequented and been going there f since I was a teenager, there were quite often issues like that on busier nights. I recognize the vice mayor. I just, Chad, I wanted to just have a clarifying question on the ordinance itself, and maybe this can kind of help balance because it feels like it's a lot of focus on the implementation, which again, I don't disagree with, but also this ordinance would allow for Center Cal to issue viol other different types of parking violations, correct? Like just for just overstay. just for over. OK, yeah, so just for failure to pay. OK, just for paying. So if they were if someone was in there with like a handy, they didn't have a handicap placard and they were parked in the handicap spot. That's enforceable anyway. Oh, that's yeah. for. OK, yeah. so then we don't even have to worry about that right. specific piece or, you know, someone parked in, you know, do not park here and they're parked, you know, in some type of loading zone, that type of situation. This is just specifically about the timing. Time. itself exactly okay and the other uh, absent this their only remedy is to tow your car so th There's so that's that. that's that's the uh, that's the enforcement mechanism that's available to private owners of, of of parking lots if someone's parking in violation of what they of their rules unless you adopt this ordinance in which case you can do a mail-in parking charge advice i'm sorry council member core I still didn't get the answer to what was the history of this thing. How did this come about? I never got the answer to that question. Senator Cal approached us after, uh, as part of their modernization of the parking. Okay. Senator Cal approached us. Yeah, I think um, you did Showed us it. Sorry, the, uh, I... that's okay. And they, they, we asked, you know, we did some research, found the other ordinances in other similar cities, looked at those, drafted one. Um, and then I did outreach to the other shopping center owners uh, trying to understand the scope of what this might, where the interest might be, and did get a uh, reception from public market as well. Member Pryforce. So, um, I mean, yeah, that could be a doom scenario of getting your car told, but, uh, towed, but uh, you have enough cars towed, then we're all replaced. And so the people can fight back, right? And so um, when it comes to... So I'm going to talk to you guys like, you know, someone who's from the start startup tech world, you know, um, the products needs iteration, right? Like that's, I think that that's what's, what, what is that? It, it, that's, that's what's happening is that what we're saying is that the enforceable part just makes it look like a CD endorsed product. But at the same, but at the same time, the experience of the user you know, from a from a customer development standpoint, is they receive something in the mail, and they go, "What the hell?" And you know, and then they go, "Why is the city coming at me like this for a crappy product, right? For a, for experience that could be a, a lot better." And so that's why, like, I think we're I, 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 so far I've not heard a lot of resistance to the idea of the enforcement. But what we're saying is that we want the enforcement you know, the, in terms of the backing of the city uh, to match a, a better quality product. And I know, and I know, Isamar, you, you've probably been on hold for a while, um, uh, but, it, but, but I think that that's, that's just the experience that I think uh, a lot of us are expressing. Um, and I used to live at Bay Street and, you know, and I'm a Marvel head. And so I was there before that you could assign seating and so I would have a chair set up to watch the next Iron Man movie, right? And so I know that there can be a queue, uh, uh, but when people can, would rather prefer a queue compared to this situation that we have now, where there's a lot of confusion and, and, and because at least with the, um, yeah, so, so, that's, so I think that that's what it is. It's just that we would prefer that you guys, you know, uh, iterate, Talk to you know to, you know go back and forth with you know, to do, do some testing, come back you know uh, to us you know have us you know sort of kind of go through the, walk through the experience and then we can go okay yeah then the city can can now enforce some of this um, uh, stuff that's going on in terms of um, uh, you know the mail in and that sort of thing and I think that that's what it is is that it, we 
I, I, I can speak, I'll speak for myself. I don't want to enforce an inferior product when I believe that the people of Emeryville and, our, and also our guests um, can, can, can get better. Okay, um, this isn't an application from an applicant. This is a city ordinance. So uh, I see there are hands raised, but I've already received public comment from those speakers. So I'm not going to call on those speakers unless there is a question for them. They are not applicants. This is not an ordinance for Bay Street or Center Cal or the public market. So Cassandra and Isamar, your hands will go down because you have already spoken. We don't give multiple times to speak unless there is a question for Bay Street or for um, uh, the public market. Okay, I don't see, you have a question? Turn your microphone on, please. Thank you, Thank you, Mayor. I do have a question. Maybe Chad, you can answer that. You said Cal, um, Cal uh, Center Cal. Center Cal approached you. Is public market a part? Had they have the same vendor? They or? do not have the same vendor. No. Okay, but public market has a different vendor, but they also trying to get this app or get the same, or what I'm trying to understand, is, it the, is there the same app citywide that can be used? No, and no, and I wanna be super clear about this because I've heard a few things. The city is not enforcing this. This is not about the city enforcing these, these regulations. Understood. This is the private operator, and they can choose whoever they want, but what this ordinance does do is makes whatever they issue enforceable and requires them to get registered with the city and to go through their processes. Understood. And I, I thank you so much for that clarification. So basically what I'm hearing is that if we had 10 different uh, places where people went to shop and they had 10 different w vendors, we would download 10 different apps for um, getting this thing enforced through the city, correct? Correct. Fortunately, this only applies to two properties. Yes, I understand. I was just making sh making the point. Yeah. So, um, thank you. Are there any other members who wish to ask questions or make comments? If not, this is a public hearing and this is an action item. Um, if there is a member who wishes to make a motion on the ordinance, you can do so. We'd make a motion to read by title only, if appropriate, please. Last call for Councilmember Mora. Uh, well, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion. Um, I, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, I think this ordinance, in the absence of the specific enforcement mechanism, um, is what where I have my misgivings because we don't want to bless a bad implementation or something that could be construed as hostile to uh, the people who we serve. Um, so, you know, I'm not uh, opposing this necessarily in the future or in all instances, but in this instance, um, I would like to make a motion to uh, not uh, adopt this ordinance. We, so typically, if we're going to not approve something, we simply take no action. There's not a motion to deny something. It's we just I, I call for motions. If there's nobody willing to make a motion to approve it, it's uh, I'll move to the next agenda item. It's dead. So are you wishing to make a motion of some kind? If not, so moved. So we have a motion from uh, Vice Mayor Welch to re I'm assuming read by title only. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to second the motion to read by title only. I want to be clear what the motion is. All it is is allowing the city attorney to read the title of the ordinance so we do not have to go through the process of reading the entire ordinance. So voting yes on this motion does not approve the ordinance. Correct, Madam City Attorney? Correct. It's all it's allowing us to do is spare the throat of the city attorney from reading the entire ordinance. So there's a motion by the vice mayor and a second by the mayor to read by title only. Please call the roll. Council member Carr. Sorry, because I have not done this before. I want to make sure what I'm saying A or nay to. You're just letting her literally read this paragraph. That's it. In our ordinance, we have to just let the city attorney either has to read the entire Emeryville Municipal Code. Yes. The law allows us to allow her to just read that paragraph. I understand. So we are not approving the ordinance or disapproving. We are just, it's all about whether you should read this or that. Yes. Okay, aye. Thank you. Councilmember Mora. Aye. 
Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Madam City Attorney, would you like to read by title only? Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. This is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Emeryville adding Chapter 15 to Title 4 of the Emeryville Municipal Code entitled Private Parking Facilities. Its CEQA determination is exempt pursuant to Guidelines Section 15061B3, 15378A, and 15378B5. Thank you. The title of the ordinance having been read and in the record as a public hearing, is there any member wishing to make a motion on the ordinance itself? All right, I move approval of the ordinance. Hey, I have a motion to approve the ordinance. Is there a second to approve the ordinance? Motion fails for lack of a second. The item is dead. We will move to item 11.2, which is the second public hearing of the evening, which is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Emeryville granting a waiver from the noise ordinance for paving work on Shell Mound Street 65th, 66th, 67th, and Hollis Streets for a consecutive 14-day period on dates to be determined between June 21st and November 19th, 2023, okay, for work with the Union Pacific Railroad. Members, by request for unanimous consent, I'm asking that we waive presentation. We've received this presentation. It's just the dates being set. Is there any objection to my request to waive unanimous consent? No. None. No, it's hearing none. Presentation is hereby waived. This is a public hearing, Madam Clerk. Time is 8.35 p.m. I call to order the public hearing. A member of the public wishing to comment on the uh, request for a noise ordinance waiver will get two minutes to do so. Is there any member of the public? Any member of the public wishing to comment? Sorry, I think I need to recuse myself. Oh, I'm sorry, Member Moore. I didn't get that note from anybody on staff, so I did not know you were recused. All right, would you like to announce yourself as yeah, being recused in statewide? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, do I just drop off the call? No, or no you need to state or... for the record the address of your property and state that you live within proximity to it, please. Uh, yes, I, I do. So I, I live at, uh, six, at 6466 Hollis, so I'm uh, close to the area where we're, we're discussing, so I need to recuse myself from this discussion. Okay, and uh, Member Mora will be he's already in the waiting room so he's he's in the attendee so he's okay madam he's in the attendees yeah he's Perfect. an attendee Thank so you. he's fine all right so uh madam clerk the system went down for me so do we have public comment speakers yes mayor we have brian donahue okay recognize brian donahue for two minutes please okay i just wanted to chastise the, the staff <clears throat> because the last issue the parking at the Bay Street. I'm what was extremely evident or extremely you know, screaming. What they didn't tell us how much money it was going to cost us if we had implemented that ordinance. Now they're going to come back again and try to sweeten the deal or whatever somehow. But why wouldn't the staff have told us the budgetary, you know, how much money this is going to cost us if we become the police for this corporation? Basically, that it, it was. The city of Emeryville, Emeryville are going to become mall cops for Bay Street Mall. The, the staff didn't tell us how much money it would cost us. So uh, shame on the staff. Why not? Why wouldn't they tell us how much money? So, you know, I, I implore the staff, just do a better job. Let the decision makers know about the budget, you know, on, on, on this kind of thing. I don't, and I can see no reason other than, you know, they like the Bay Street Mall and they want to do this favor for them. So shame on the staff. Are there any other members of the public here to speak on this item? No? Okay, the public hearing is closed at 8.37 p.m. I'll bring it back for discussion. Members, is there any discussion on this item? Member Pryforce? My apologies. My apologies, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Clerk, um, and, um, and uh, uh, City Attorney. Um, I have to uh, recuse myself as well. No, oh. you don't. You don't own property. Oh, you're a renter, right? Got it. Yes. Yeah. This okay. is only if you own property within a thousand feet of the site. Okay. Got it. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, and I see the I see Member Morris hand raised, but we're not addressing him because he's recused. So, uh, is there any further discussion or debate? I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution to grant the noise wa waiver for this item. I second. Thank you. Motion by Bowder, second by Welch to approve. This resolution, please call the roll. Councilmember Carr. 
Aye. Councilmember Mora is recused. Uh, Councilmember Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. The motion passes. The resolution is approved. Uh, Councilmember Mora is back in the meeting. There are no action items this evening, members. Department head reports, are there any department head reports late breaking? There are not, thank you, Mayor. Okay, no department head reports. Future agenda item requests, are there members of council who have a future agenda item request? Member Pryforce. Uh, uh, so I would like to place on the future, um, uh, future agenda item uh, the creation of, and uh, especially given the recent events with uh, our former president, um, and um, and yeah, so I would um, ethics is really important, and I have mentioned it uh, uh, previously, and uh, I believe that an independent ethics committee or commission um, uh, should be created um, by um, by our body, and um, and from my understanding, uh, th th several times that it was um, no, no, so I'm not going to discuss any further, but. Um, in the spirit of what we are owed to uh, when it comes to our positions in government, I will um, I will commence with the uh, with the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there three votes to agenda the requested item? Okay, seeing none. Uh, are there other members who have a future agenda item request? I have, I have a request this evening. Um, my request is to ask staff to come back. Well, so let me preface my request with why I'm making my request. Um, this is National Pollinator Week, and uh, the Movement towards climate catastrophe, I think, is uh, a serious one, and there are efforts that can be made locally to do things that improve and protect uh, pollinators as well as the food web for which we are members of. And I would like to propose a series of small ordinances uh, that would improve Emeryville's standing as a community that supports pollinators and protects the food web against harmful toxics. I would like to ask for a study session to uh, have staff come back to prepare potential ordinances for the following items. An ordinance to ban neonicotinoids, which is a known pesticide of which there are several categories that are extremely harmful and kill honeybees and other pollinators, including waterborne insects that feed fish and birds. To ban rodenticides, which when consumed by rodents and then Rodents are consumed by birds of prey, especially osprey, owl, and hawks, which are native to this area, poison and kill the owlets and other small birds that are um, part of our food web here. I would like to third request that we amend the Emeryville Municipal Code's nuisance ordinance related to lawn maintenance to expressly allow for the placement and growth of wildflowers in lieu of a lawn in Emeryville homes so that we can create spaces for bees and butterflies. And fourthly, the consideration of a voluntary wildflowering program that would promote and improve butterfly and bee habitat as well as fruit trees in the city of Emeryville by uh, creating a space where Emeryville residents with property could um, agree to maintain trees and or plant with the city's assistance wildflowers in a manner conducive to protecting biodiversity. Um, that is my request. Are there three votes to support a study session to agenda those items? I vote yes. Member Pryforce is absent or quiet. Member Mora? Uh, yes, I, I support that. Okay, there are four votes yes, so that will be Other agenda. Sessions. Can I add to that agenda item? Can request. Yeah. Uh, yes, on that banning of the rodenticides, uh, there are many rodents where I live. <laughs> And the only way they can get rid of those rats is with the rodenticides or traps. So I would like to get, have the study session include um, the, the number of people or the number of HOAs that use rodenticides. Yeah. Well, the study session, I will offer to work with staff to ensure all that information is available, what options and alternatives exist, and what is the current yeah. practices of the city and businesses as part of it. We'll bring it in the fall. Fantastic. Okay. 
So that will be, uh, that has got a majority support for eyes. So we'll um, agenda that for some time in the fall when staff have the information for a study session. Okay, all right. Are there any other additional future agenda item requests? Okay, seeing and hearing none. That takes us to adjournment. The time is 844. This meeting is adjourned. Wish all of you a very uh, happy, healthy, and uh, successful last week of Pride.